In this video, I will explain the motivations behind us building a ferro cement house. Furthermore, I will attempt to explain why my parents decided to move to the countryside and build a house using such a peculiar construction method. In order to understand this, first we must learn a little something about Bob Foote. Bob Foote is the man who developed the intentional community that my parents chose to buy land in and to construct their home. Foote was a charismatic, highly motivated individual with a fascination for alternative technologies and was convinced that our society could make better use of its resources, both human and material. He developed three communities in North Texas, two of which were off-grid, secular, intentional communities with ferro-cement houses. To further understand his motivations for building these communities, let's look at some vintage source material. The following is an introductory message from a series of classes he taught on alternative technology. When I was in high school, we were in the midst of wartime shortages and rationing. We went directly from depression with no money, to buy anything, to war with nothing to buy. We won the war, I think, and decided to get the things that we had never had. We splurged in a grand way. The next wars didn't stop the splurging. In my high school chemistry book, uranium was listed as a worthless trace element. My mechanical engineering handbook had a section on energy that listed the quantities of coal, oil, wood, and gas that were available on Earth. It predicted the probable use of these resources and predicted about when they would run short. No one paid much attention to that kind of information. Thirty years away was the distant future, and we had harnessed the atom, and unlimited, almost free energy was just around the corner. Well, we used more energy faster than predicted. We went from exporting to importing oil, and that unlimited, almost free energy is still just around the corner. Only the corner seems farther away now than it did then. What this comes down to is that we have been had, and our children and grandchildren have been had by the politicians and oil priests and peddlers. We've been sold a high-energy, high-waist, high-wide, fast and handsome joyride, and we've bought it hook, line, and sinker. Ski boats, skyscrapers, Cadillacs, credit cards, and colored television. We bought it fast and threw it away almost as fast as we bought a newer, better one. We splurged on an oil and gas binge that sent us to the moon and to war. We put all our eggs in the nuclear energy basket by deciding to use all of our easy oil on building nuclear fission generators. We only have enough easy uranium to fuel them for a very few years, which puts all our eggs in a breeder reactor using plutonium. Now, plutonium happens to be the most dangerous substance ever made or ever thought of, and the breeder reactor hasn't been built yet. But the experts tell us that we have nothing to worry about. Besides, the fusion reactor is just around the corner with the same unlimited, almost free electricity we've been hearing about for 25 years. Well, maybe it is. But I've found that believing the politicians and experts is what got us into this in the first place. We already have a fusion reactor that is almost unlimited, and it is at just barely safe distance from us, 93 million miles. A usable criteria for judging any action not demanded by your own nerve endings is this. Rule number one, would the action be appropriate if the premises of the belief system which promotes it are false? If it wouldn't, you better think twice. Anyway, I splurged along with everyone else and got all those things that were dangled in front of me and found I didn't have time to use them, that I had to stand in line to hurry up and have fun so I could be back at work next Monday so I could make the big money so I could pay the big taxes so I could live in the nice house and drive the nice car so I could go to work so I could make the big money to live in the nice house and drive the nice car so I could stand in line to hurry up and have fun so I could be back at work Monday so I could make the ad nauseum. I had worked around the military and industrial experts and progressed far enough to be around people making important decisions, but no matter how much gold braid on his cap or initials after his name or titles, he was still worried about maintaining his position and chopping the ladder from under his boss and trying to keep his own rung from being chopped out from under him. He very seldom could even see his nose or find his other end with both hands in the dark. He had become an expert at maintaining his position, and usually that is the only type of expertise that is rewarded by that game. So I extrapolated the trends, and in the late 50s we dropped out. We took five kids out of school, sold or gave away everything that wouldn't fit in our sailboat, and split. We cruised the west coast and then worked a while, but never enough to pay any taxes, and lived on the beach in Mexico, and then worked a while and played homestead in Oregon, and worked a while here in Texas. 
We found some things here that have long been gone everywhere else, so we stayed. We watched and waited, and the politicians and experts made less and less sense. I don't listen very much anymore. A waste of time. Almost two years ago, we decided it was time to dig in and get ready for tomorrow, and that's what this is all about. We need to get together at the neighborhood level and take responsibility for our own survival. And what if the experts are right? I hope they are, but if they aren't, it's still a fine way to live. Low technology, tranquil, organic lifestyles. Remember, rule number one. Whatever the belief system or reason, we all need to make more responsible use of our resources. In another document, which I assume to have been written by Bob or his wife Ruth, he answers questions about the neighborhood. All of Neighborhood Valley is private property, owned and maintained by individuals cooperating with each other. All that you see here has been done without any grant subsidies or outside financing. The dwellings under construction are being built by the owners, usually on a shoestring with available funds and spare time. This is not a commune or cult or extended family, but a collection of individuals and families from widely diverse backgrounds who have decided to do something about the existing and imminent resource and financial crises. We have voluntarily chosen a simplified lifestyle, not as a reaction to any shortage or situation, but as a more positive and fulfilling way to live. While we are very aware and concerned about ecological and environmental problems, the energy crisis, inflation, and so forth, we believe that the only solutions involve personal and individual actions. The problems are not primarily political and therefore defy political solution. We are not promoting or advocating anything except the free exchange of information. We all value our privacy and do not look forward to opening our gates to the public, and in fact this will be the last time we will do so, but all of us feel an obligation to inform others of what we feel are several steps towards solutions to these problems. It is our hope that families seeing what is being done at Neighborhood Valley will get some ideas for their own desired change in lifestyle. Most of us feel we are not withdrawing from society, as most breadwinners leave the property to work at outside jobs. Until we are in a position to be able to grow most of our own fruits and vegetables organically on our own land, we will continue to shop in the supermarkets or farmers markets for our food. We do dream, dream of becoming as self-sufficient as possible. In the future, growing our own food and being able to manufacture certain items of value that can be sold for living expenses. We help each other to build our homes much the same way the pioneers in America helped each other when there was a cabin to build. We find it a friendly and happy thing to do and we find that the ultimate creativity is to build your own house with your own two hands. As far as the question about our religion, we can tell you a lot of things that we are not. We are not an organized religion, not a cult, not a structured philosophical group with rules to adhere to. We are interested in anything that is uplifting, beautiful, honest, and creative, and we believe in living as close to nature as is practical. That's a big thing, practical. Uh, we believe that there is a brotherhood of man, and we are meant to love one another and to be a good neighbor. Jonathan Livingston Seagull by Richard Bach uh, has a message for us all in regard to our unlimited possibilities for a happy and constructive life. We feel there is a little of Jonathan in all of us, and we are striving to demonstrate perfection and excellence. Kiplinger letter wrote of a movement that is growing in our nation of people that are intellectuals striving to change their lifestyles to live closer to the soil growing their own food. They call these people the voluntary simple folk. We don't really call ourselves anything as we have not stopped working towards our common goals long enough to give it much thought. But we are in hopes that we will find freedom in an unfree world. First off, let's unpack this a little bit. The development of the neighborhood started in the summer of 1977. The oil crisis, also known as the oil embargo of 1973, was very recent history and exposed the dangers of having a society fueled by imported oil. Then, again in 1978, the Iranian Revolution began, and during this time, Iranian oil output declined, prompting the energy crisis of 1978 through 1979. During this event, unemployment was on the rise, the dollar was losing value, and inflation went up 9% in one year. 
With this in mind, it becomes easier to recognize that Bob Foote's writings from this time period was from a place of legitimate concern and I can respect his efforts to take pragmatic steps to build a neighborhood of like-minded individuals who would be hardened to a possible continued decline in the American economy. Needless to say, Foote was quite timely in his efforts to redesign what a neighborhood could be, and I imagine it would have been easy to want to be a part of something like this. By 1979, even President Jimmy Carter had to tackle publicly the, rea the realities of lines at the gas pumps that stretch for blocks, unemployment, and inflation. Remarkably, he was able to learn of and recognize the anxieties felt by the American people. In his famous Malay's speech, he says, The threat is nearly invisible in ordinary ways. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of unity of purpose for our nation. In a nation that was proud of hard work, strong families, close-knit communities, and our faith in God, too many of us now tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption. Human identity is no longer defined by what one does, but by what one owns. But we've discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. We've learned that piling up material goods cannot fill the emptiness of lives which have no confidence of purpose. According to Kevin Matson, author of What the Heck Are You Up To, Mr. President, Jimmy Carter had grown increasingly convinced that Americans had to face up to the energy crisis, but they could only do this if they faced up to the crisis in their own values. He tried to push the energy crisis on a kind of moral and civic plane, and the speech was used to unify around a sense of civic sacrifice. This is why I think my parents decided to build a Ferris cement house. They had graduated from college, and the world they inherited appeared to be in crisis. Being young, liberal-minded folks, they decided to try and find what Jimmy Carter would later call confidence of purpose by building the house with their bare hands and being proud of the hard work it involved. The ferro cement just so happened to be a part of the process. And today, I, I continue it alongside my dad. All right, let's talk about uh, the, the business model for this, for this neighborhood. So first of all, the neighborhood was 80 acres and it had two square <laughs> edges uh, with fences and then the other was followed a, a, a creek so this is the creek right right there and then the had the main entrance and you had a, a barn and you also had a little farmhouse here the the, the farmhouse wound up uh, belonging to uh, Bob's wife when it was all said and done anyways the main road is a circle with a cut and a couple side roads and then there was 18 18 houses scattered about in here yeah, somewhere you know uh, yeah, there's another road here with a couple houses and uh and and the main thing that Bob did was was he provided a very low entry for for uh, buying into this you know he he owner financed to the residents who wanted to live there uh, something about I think it was was uh, fifteen hundred dollars uh, per half acre and you know my dad wound up buying two acres so so for for you know six thousand bucks you're able to buy into to a community paying that out over years and then the the neighborhood had people who were willing to do work parties and throw mud to help you build your house and and so that's what he was talking about with uh well, I forget how I phrased it, but you know, it, it was a sweat equity, uh, paycheck to paycheck home building. So it didn't exclude anybody. You know, almost anybody could have could have bought into this. You know, but but eventually it did. It, it filled up, and and as Bob put it, uh, neighborhood became complete. But what's uh, really interesting is he didn't sell all this land. He sold enough land to pay for the whole thing. And then all of this, and some of this, and all of this, and little sections in between, uh, 
became, you know, the 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 park, the the commonly held land that that's up kept by the property owners association. You know, there's small dues. Um, I, you know, I don't pay them, so I don't even know what they are. But maybe it's fifty bucks a month or something. You know, there's there's a road maintenance fee and a park fee, and and then uh, I think there's also a water fee that's like fifteen dollars a month for upkeep of the well. Because every now and then, you know, pump will burn up or suck sand or you know who who knows. The the, the well's pretty old. But but anyways, with with this business model, you know, his, sort of following his his uh his early unbanking philosophy he was he was able to to secure a a i think a, an owner finance loan from the farmer to buy this and then he in turn owner financed the lots to pay for it to the individuals that wanted to build a house out here i i really think it's it's just so slick and and uh and fair the way he did it and then he didn't max out the the revenue here you know he uh he he gave all this other stuff well you know a lot of it was floodplain or whatever uh, as a park and so now we have we have this beautiful trail that you can walk all the way around you know we we have we have our our uh, barn with that's like a wood shop and and um and and you know uh we have a field we have forest we have we have creek we have a pond over here somewhere Anyways, there's a there's a lot of attributes going to this, and it's and it's all wild. You know, none of these houses have have fenced off their their property from each other. You know, all they do is they'll build a little you know dog containing fence. You know, one 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 person built a, a round fence to keep his dogs in, and I don't know. So so you can walk anywhere, everywhere. It, it's almost like it's your own land, and only having I think 18 families plus one guy has a, a shop. And uh, another guy's building a shop in a different part. Uh, you, you can you can walk around as if it's your own private land. You hardly see anybody, and if you do see them, it's 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 almost like family at this point. I've known these people literally my entire life. You know, because I came around in um, 1985. I was born, and and at that point, uh, Bob had already moved on, and he was doing a another community, a, a bigger version of this, and his wife Ruth was was. Uh, only one left living living on the land but anyways uh, I hope that's useful that, that's the I think the 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 what made this all possible was was the fairness of of how he he developed it and and what the what the master plan was um, so in the next video I plan to go through the construction of the house uh, in, in picture form and narration until we get at the current construction phase. And uh, while we're on that journey, I'll explain the specific attributes as to why you know, we're, we're still using ferro cement and what, what it can do for us. And also, uh, we'll talk about what our plan is in building the house and burying it, you know, all that stuff. But a lot of that's still up in the air, honestly. It's, it's a, a work in progress. Uh, in, in not just uh, physical work, but also in just the mental game of deciding uh, what do we want it to the end goal to be. So, anyways, I hope you uh, enjoyed this video, and thank you so much for your time. Do a little earthquake test. You filming? Yeah. Okay, this is the earthquake test. You make a ball of mud in your fist in your palm. Then you agitate it, and you watch the slump. This is called the slump, technically. <laughs> I think I'm shaking the camera too. And uh, that's okay. It's coming along. My shoes untied. <laughs> <laughs>